You're listening to the Back Porch Talk Podcast. Danny and Jason had many discussions and debates on the back porch while making pivotal investment moves with assets. That's right, with trading cards. They welcome you to the back porch and right into those discussions about current sports news with a fresh and unique twist. So come on and join us. Welcome to the Back Porch Talk Podcast. I'm your co-host, Jason. Your co-host, Danny. Fans, we got a full show for you today. Let's get to it. First, we'll talk about the NFL, a little bit about the baseball playoffs, college football, NBA preseason. And yes, we do have a trading card scenario for you. But first, Danny, right into the NFL. And oh boy, what a cool weekend it was, man, for the NFL. I feel I'm starting to feel a little bit bad for the Bears. And as a Packers fan, I shouldn't actually I kind of relish in them doing bad, quite honestly. But at the same token, token, not to the detriment of injuries and all, it seems like uh Justin Fields got injured here. Uh seems like it's something dealing with his uh thumb, dislocated thumb. Uh, and the Bears take this L against uh, division rival, the Minnesota Vikings, 19-13, to 13, uh, bringing the Bears to a 1-5 and five record. Vikings not too far behind, though, at 2-4. and four. Uh, I, I can sense more so Vikings improving on their record uh, more so than the Bears. And quite honestly, man, I see the Bears going with the number one draft pick again this year. Uh, a lot of question marks, I believe, the Bears will have. Justin Fields gets injured. Uh, we'll see where this goes, man. If the Bears get the number one draft pick, will they keep Justin Fields? Mm-hmm. If I was Justin Fields, I don't know if I want to be kept by the Bears. <laughs> Send me anywhere else but the Chicago Bears at this point, man. Also this weekend, uh, some of the scores that really stands out to me here, Danny, is that of the uh, Baltimore Ravens, squeaking out this victory in London against Tennessee Titans. Uh, this was a huge rivalry. Who can ever forget Eddie George? I mean, Ray Lewis going at it. I mean, uh, Steve Eric McNair, rest in peace. Uh, and they take this rivalry over to London, and the Ravens prevail. Uh, the Bengals beat the Seattle Seahawks 17-13. Bengals are starting to kind of uh, get on a roll here. Uh, that's one other uh, score that stood out. The other, the upset of the weekend, I believe, was with was the Cleveland Browns against the 49ers 19-17. The Browns prevail. The 49ers actually had some injuries in this one as well. Just a few uh, games that really stood out. Uh, another upset, uh, the Jets beat the Eagles 20 to 14. Uh, and I have to say this, Danny, another game that I actually watched uh, a little bit more of uh, was a Monday night game, the Cowboys against the Chargers. And I think I really watched it for a couple of reasons. One, I absolutely love the the stadium in LA. The architecture is absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. I uh, always love seeing that, looking at that stadium. Uh, the second reason is Marquise Bell, man, for the Cowboys, continues to impress. Uh, Marquise Bell, he is a Florida A&M alum, so I uh, have been keeping tabs on him. I'm not a Cowboys fan, but I am a Marquise Bell fan. Uh, and so they prevail, the Cowboys prevail 2017. Dak Prescott uh, throws for 272 yards, uh, runs for a touchdown, throws for a touchdown. Uh, so very interesting weekend. What say you, Danny, about uh, this NFL weekend? Jason, I have to lead off with my Falcons taking this L against the Washington Commanders. A lot of things went wrong in this game. Desmond Ritter threw for over 300 yards, but he had three interceptions, one crucial one at the end of the game. They had um, a delay of game penalty, which pushed them back a few yards, at five yards. And Desmond Ritter scrambles and just throws the ball up in the end zone. I don't know what he was looking at. I don't know what he was doing, which ultimately cost them the game. They also, because they lost 24-16, 
when they scored to ter- uh, make it 24-16, they went for two and got stuffed. And they went for fourth, went for it on fourth and fourth and three at midfield in the first half, which they got stopped. And then Washington went down and scored. It was just a comedy of errors where this is a game they should have definitely won. And it still begs the question, how much rope does Desmond Ritter still have left before he gets yanked? Because you can't have these type of performances. I know he's still he's still a rookie. I consider him a rookie. He only had four games last year, but some of the mistakes being made, and some on the coaching staff side. The other thing too is the defense is playing well, but they're not causing turnovers. So it's there's a lot of things just going on here where they could be better than what they are, taking advantage of some of these opportunities, which they're not. That was a tough game from our standpoint, and uh, we have Tampa Bay this week. We'll see how that goes as a division uh, matchup. As far as the other games are concerned, Jason, yeah, the Eagles get upset. Jalen Hurts, he had some bad interceptions in this game. The Jets defense came to play, and they are banged up. Two of their top corners were out. Uh, the Browns beat the 49ers with P.J. Walker, not Deshaun Watson. The Sunday night game was interesting because it was the Bills and the Giants where Tyrod Taylor was the quarterback because Daniel Jones was out. And Buffalo, man, it's just something not right. And I see Josh Allen, and, you know, they hype him up as, you know, one of the top quarterbacks, but the Giants, you only score 14 points. So there's something to be said there, and it was just an, an odd week in in the NFL. And this week we have a lot of buys coming up, so we'll see in a lot of divisional matchups. So looking forward to that. And and then right into the MLB playoffs, baseball playoffs, and where there's been surprises here for me, Danny, uh, in this uh, playoffs. First of all, let me just say to uh, Major League Baseball, I am not a fan of how uh, many games are played in the series. Uh, I believe the first series started off with three games, best out of three, second round, if you will, best of five, and then uh, ultimately best of seven. Absolutely hate it, man. It's going to be real. Uh, because I would have loved to have seen the Braves Phillies game series go and be like a a seven game type series mm-hmm. to see if Braves could turn around. And I am I am shocked, quite frankly, that the Braves got done the way that they got done <laughs> by the Phillies. Man, uh, I did not see that coming, man. Uh, the one victory that the Braves had in that series towards the well, basically to wrap up the game, uh, man, it was a phenomenal double play. But after that, I mean, the Phillies was just all up in them, man. Mm-hmm. Wasn't afraid of them at all. Wasn't afraid of their offense. Uh, and the Braves are out. Uh, I was picking them to really kind of go all the way, quite frankly, but. The Phillies went ahead and proved me wrong and proved a lot of other people wrong. The other stock to me was how, man, come on, Arizona, how they did L.A.? First of all, got whooped in that first inning, man. And I think that set the tone for the rest of the series, yep. quite frankly. And I did not see uh, the Arizona Diamondbacks really uh, doing that to the – LA Dodgers the way that they did, man. And I would to, I would have loved to have seen uh Mookie and, and uh Freddie to you know advance there. Uh but Arizona said not so. Uh and that really kind of made me a little upset because I really felt that if the Brewers could have gotten past Arizona, could they have beaten the Dodgers? Granted, we don't have the offense like uh, Arizona, but I think with the way Kershaw was throwing, man, I think anybody could <laughs> hit the ball against him, man. So I think we would have been in the game. We, we, we would have been in the series. I just need the Brewers just to improve 
the bats a little bit. Uh, probably got to get, you know, a couple more pitchers, et cetera. Uh, but we need to improve the bats, man. Uh, so just a, a few surprises from that standpoint. What say you, Danny, about these uh, baseball playoffs so far? Yeah, that Braves-Philly series, man, was intense. For those of you who did not know this, but when uh, Harper got doubled up, what Jason was talking about at the end of the game, too, and Arcia was caught on a hot mic talking smack, and then the next game, Bryce Harper hit that home run. <laughs> it mugged him. That set the tone, man, because that gave the Phillies, that kind of lit a fire under them, which they are have been playing that way already through the playoffs. But now, man, like last night, even against the Diamondbacks, you know, Schwarber and uh, Bryce start the game off with home runs. They end up pulling that one out. But it was – the Phillies are on that on that path, man. And truth be told, they held the Braves to zero, one, and two runs in three of those four games. The ones they won. So their pitching came through. And then with the Dodgers – Mookie and Freddie Freeman, man, they let them down. I know, uh, like you mentioned, Kershaw did what he did in game one, but Mookie and Freddie Freeman had one hit. One across the whole series. Kudos to the Diamondbacks. And right now, I think the Diamondbacks, can they're playing free, man, because they're not even supposed to be where they're at. And I'm curious to see how they come back in game two against Philadelphia. Uh, and then we had the Rangers and the Astros, and the Rangers jumped on the Astros uh, 2-0. So it'll be definitely, I don't know, from a national standpoint, a viewership, if Philadelphia and Texas make it to the uh, or the World Series. But I'll definitely be interested in that if these two are on the crash course to meet each other because they both have offense and they both have good pitching. So it'll be a great World Series, I think, um, based on how they're playing right now. But there's still a lot of baseball left to be played in both these championship series. And Danny, right on into college football and where the highlight for me for the weekend was Colorado just blowing this lead that they had. Uh, first of all, Danny, full transparency, I watched the end of this game. Um, I did not know upon watching and turning it on that Colorado was up at one point 29 and nothing at Colorado against Stanford. I just didn't know that Stanford would, would do this. And they came back and won the game in double overtime. And I watched the until end of this game. And that's when the announcer said this was the largest comeback for Stanford and the low, largest blown lead by Colorado. And I just thought, how could this happen? And it seemed like what Coach Prime indicated, he felt something like this was going to happen based upon the moxie or, or what was said on the sidelines by his players and even at halftime, et cetera. And it came back to be the bite on uh, and all. Uh, so just interesting that Colorado uh, blows this lead. Colorado has already exceeded expectations from last year. They only won one game last year. Uh, I believe they have four victories this year. So mm -hmm. um, they've already exceeded what they uh, did last year. Uh, but the goal here is obviously to a bowl game um, and eventually to a championship. And I believe he'll get that. Uh, through a transfer portal. I think next season he'll coach prime will go ahead and, you know, get some new players, et cetera. Uh, and we'll see what happens, but man, that to me was a highlight for a weekend for college football. How about you? Yeah, Jason, as you watched the end of the game, I watched the beginning of the game and thought it was over. <laughs> it said it was 29 zero Colorado had all the momentum. And when I woke up in the morning and I saw that score, I couldn't believe it. But that goes to show you just don't know and you can't you can't sit there and celebrate when the game is not over. It's not zero 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 on that clock. The defense just fell apart. And this was a game 
they needed to have, I think, based on their upcoming schedule, in order to become bowl eligible, they got to get them next week. But that was one that's going to hurt them, especially if they don't qualify for a bowl. <clears throat> Other game, Jason, I just want to mention is Washington, Oregon on Saturday. And for those of you who did not see that game, definite instant classic, as they used to call it on ESPN. Uh, they were just going back and forth. And then Penix Jr., man, keeping his name in the Heisman race, throws a touchdown. And actually there was talk about how much time it, Washington left on the clock because their defense was just giving up stuff left and right. Their defense came in and stepped up and closed that game out for them. So it was a great win by Washington. I was happy to see Penix, <clears throat> Michael Penix Jr. get that, that W because that – uh, kept him in the Heisman race, and he's deserving of it because he's been playing lights out. Uh, Bo Nix had a great game, too, on the Oregon side, but Washington gets that W, man, and keeps it moving. Yeah, I'll say this, too, Danny. Another game that was out there uh, was that of USC against Notre Dame, where Notre Dame bounces back 48-20 to against USC. Uh, Caleb Williams threw for uh, 199 yards, uh, a touchdown, three picks. Um, so that going to be interesting to see how that uh, does with this Heisman run. Uh, but nonetheless, man, Notre Dame uh, pulls this out. Uh, we'll see what happens with Notre Dame moving forward, Danny. I just have never been a huge Notre Dame fan other than when back in the uh, 80s with quarterback Tony Rocket mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> in uh, Notre Dame. They, they go ahead and do this thing. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. And now, Danny, on to uh, a little bit about the NBA and where the NBA now is in full preseason mode. Uh, one week from away from the start of the NBA season. And let me just say this, Danny. I, I did get a chance to watch Giannis and Dane on Sunday, and, and you know this because we were in the uh, text message thread and everything. Uh, and let me just say this, Danny, what I text uh, to the fellas and, and, and all, and looking at the Bucks roster, I did not like the acquisition of Robin Lopez. I still don't like the acquisition of Robin Lopez after this preseason game, man. When Robin Lopez was here the first time I was like, man, get him out of here. And I was happy that they did that. And lo and behold, they brought him back. That's probably part of Brooke Lopez. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> That's <laughs> the brother deal, like the honest <laughs> Yanni. Come on, man. Uh, the other thing that I texted in there uh, was about camera pain. Now, we'll see how long he holds up. Uh, I think he's an adequate uh, backup uh, point guard uh, and all, uh, but again, we'll see how he holds up. The second unit that was put out there, I, I wasn't feeling as much, but they still need some time to gel. I think they're still trying to find who's going to be truly in that second um, unit there. Middleton didn't play. Uh, I think that is going to go a long way. Um, my understanding is that he is going to play the preseason, so I would love to see how that all meshes with uh, Dame and, and Giannis. Um, I put in here that defensively, Dame is going to be attacked a whole lot. I don't know how much you would hide Dame, especially in the playoffs where bigger guards would go at him. Uh, and so I'm going to be curious to see how that really uh, plays a role, especially with the uh, opposing opposing uh, teams um, outside shooting. Um, so we'll see how how that goes. And, but I did put offensively, Bucks have so many options. Uh, right now, preseason is vanilla offense, mm -hmm. but I, I did see glimpses of a whole lot of pick and roll action. Um, Dame is going to make those who go under that screen suffer. It's going to open things up even more. Mm -hmm. um, and that's for the regular season. I'm anxious to see what's going to happen in the postseason, though. Uh, when you have better defenders, longer defenders, I think if you have longer defenders, Dame is going to have to get up the shot kind of quick. And Bochamp looked good. Mm -hmm. 
I think Boach Camp is going to be uh, a fixture in rotation, uh, especially with the second unit. Uh, and, uh, and I don't think they have any other choice when it comes, but honestly, because he has younger legs and they're going to need that moving forward. So uh, preseason for the Bucks to me was is preseason. I've got a week to go. Uh, we'll see what happens. What say you, Danny, about uh, preseason? A couple items, Jay, on that Bucks lakers game. Yeah, everything was vanilla. LeBron didn't play from the Lakers side. But the intensity, so on Friday night, watching Wimbiyama when they played the Heat, granted the Heat sat a lot of their normal starters, but the intensity of these preseason games seems a little more escalated for whatever reason. I don't know why. Maybe I haven't seen basketball in a while. But like the Lakers played the Warriors Friday night as well as a doubleheader. And that game was going back and forth, Steph, and all the stars were playing in that game. And they were just hooping. It was good to see. And, you know, for after the first half, then, you know, they started using the bench. But uh, very exciting. On the Bucks front, it was exciting to see Dame in their uniform. Like you mentioned, want to see Middleton there and kind of see how the ball swings and flows and who's ball dominant, who's not. And where they, how the spacing is, because with Dame out there, instantly helps the spacing. Because the Lakers, Giannis made this comment in his post game press conference about how the Lakers went right at Dame, like double teaming him. And he's like, "Whoa, I've never had this before." <laughs> where he's exclusively one on one, and and that's where they can take a lot of uh, advantage of teams. You know, with Giannis down low. And I did notice Giannis in the post, you know, with the whole Elijah one mm-hmm. thing going on. With you know, he tried to do a couple fadeaways. Mm-hmm. So he's trying to incorporate that incorporate that in his game. And if he can get that working because he's so tall, man, you know, the fadeaway, the taller you are, the harder it is, you can't block it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I did I did notice that. But it was good to see Dame out there and he wasn't forcing anything. He played his game. And that's where I think it'll be good to see them once the season gets started and their regular season action, what that offense looks like and how um, how they move the ball and who's going, who's in, who's where. They had Crowder in the starting lineup, which I think that's what will happen in the season. You know, we talked about that last time. You mentioned that. Mm-hmm. So all in all, it was, it was good to see on a Sunday night. It was wasn't expecting that type of um, intensity, and it was good to see. And I would say, Danny, to your point about the intensity in these NBA preseason games, I think it's because the nature, especially in the Western Conference, is going is so competitive, mm-hmm. so deep that these teams are going to have to get off to a good start. Forget about ramping up; you mm-hmm. need to be ramped up in preseason uh, in Dahl. And you also have all these movements and lineups and people are trying, teams are trying to figure out rotation and stuff like that. So I think this is a little bit different than years past where you have not as many preseason games. Yep. Season starts. uh, And now you also have this um, in-season tournament. I'm anxious to see how that kind of works out as well. Yeah. Um, but I think, quite honestly, this in-season tournament, I don't think the players really worry as much about that. I think they're just looking to sink and gel, quite frankly, and whatever game they're playing, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like we said before, we thought, or I thought initially, people, the teams would go ahead and play their backups for these in-season tournament games. No, I think they're going to have their starters play because they need these victories, especially with how deep uh, the Western Conference is uh, in Dahl. So we'll see. And now getting on to this trading card scenario, who we got? Tonight's scenario is Sean Kemp's 1990 Hoops rookie card for Blake Griffin's 2009 Upper Deck rookie card. A couple quick bios, Sean Kemp was the 17th overall pick by the Seattle Supersonics in the 1989 NBA draft. Uh, Six-time All-Star, three-time All-NBA, averaged 14.6 points, eight rebounds, two assists. 
Blake Griffin was the number one overall pick by the LA Clippers in the 2009 NBA draft. He was a six-time All-Star, five-time All-NBA, and the Rookie of the Year. Career averages were 19 points, eight rebounds, and four assists. Jason, who do you want in this old-school trading card scenario? Dang, this was an interesting one, man. I kept going back and forth. Um, and I found an impressive stat. In Sean Kemp's last season in the NBA, which was 2002-2003, he played 79 games. His last season, 79 games he played in. And that was for Orlando. And it was probably with Big Sean. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he played in 79 games his last season was impressive. And then I looked at the rest of his career, man, and he had a high number of games that he played in a season. Sean Kemp did go to a finals. He did where they say uh, Super Science played the Chicago Bulls against the Jordan Bulls, Scotty Pippen Bulls. Yeah, they lost. Seattle lost against the Chicago Bulls in that finals, but they did eke out two wins. So Blake Griffin never got to conference finals in his career. Uh, he had an injury play year or a career, uh, especially looking at his first season where he didn't even start his rookie rookie season he had an ACL injury for the glitz and glamour I would I would take Blake because of obviously the dunks and everything but you can't forget about the in-game dunks that Sean Kemp had are you kidding me are you kidding me in Seattle hey man in my portfolio I want Sean Kemp who you got then from a player standpoint <clears throat> Jason I agree I think Sean Kemp when he was with Seattle, that lockout really derailed Sean Kemp's career, for those of you who remember, because he had moved to Cleveland. <clears throat> he had signed that contract, but then he had he wasn't in, in playing shape, let's call it that. And after that, that derailed his whole career because he wasn't his athleticism had just went away. He was just straight on the ground, you know, shooting jumpers you know, trying to pound people with his weight. But that wasn't his game, and ultimately that was his demise for his NBA career because uh, he just wasn't the same player after that lockout. And then you look at Blake Griffin, and he was high flyer, could shoot. And Blake's teams with CP3 and DeAndre Jordan, they fell short. I don't know if it, who's who was to blame. But usually there was an injury or something happened where they just couldn't get over the hump. And Blake's kind of bounced around over his career now since being in L.A., where I think if he would have been healthy, Blake Griffin may have got that title, but he just was injury prone and he just couldn't, he couldn't do it. So as I look at this from a card perspective, I'm taking Blake Griffin's card. I want his card in my portfolio. From a player perspective, I'm rolling with Sean Kemp. Sean Kemp just had that killer instinct. Like I said, I'm basing this all on Seattle. Post-Seattle, then it was a different Sean Kemp. But when he was in Seattle and they used to battle and the Western Conference was what it was, and then obviously Jordan sitting there in the NBA Finals waiting for you in the 90s. That wasn't what that wasn't no one was gonna win that. And they actually had a shot too to beat Jordan and them. But all in all, I want Blake Griffin's car, but Sean Kemp is a player on my team. Thank you for joining us at Backports Talk Podcast. You can also join us on Twitter by tweeting us at back underscore podcast. For more information, you can go to our website, which is backporchtalkpodcast.com. You can also email us at backporchtalkpodcast at gmail.com. Again, thank you for joining us. And remember that there's enough hate in the world. So go ahead and spread a little love.